You guys ready for the word? All right, make up again. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be rusty today. I'm not on coffee this morning, and I've been off for two weeks. So I'm going to be boring, slow, methodical. Yeah. But if you'll stand for the reading of God's word, see if I remember how to do this. We're going to be in John chapter 7. We're almost done with chapter 7. That's good. We're going to be in John chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 37 today. And this is, we've been in this for a long time. And it's, Jesus has gone to this feast. It started with his brothers challenging him. Like, why don't you go up there to become popular, to be known, like to be uh, lifted up as this Messiah if you're really him. The whole chapter has been people like arguing who he is, hating him, arguing with him. And he's coming to the last day of this festival, which we're going to talk about. Uh, And he finally, he steps up and it says he cries out like with passion, with like, it was insistence about what he has to say. He finally stands up in front of everybody on the last day of this festival. It's one of the greatest days of celebration to give a message. And this, so it's an important one. So let's read and read these words of God. It says this, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, Rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is a prophet. Others said, He is the Messiah. Still others asked, How can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So again, it comes to the end of this section, and they're like, who is this guy? We don't know if we trust him. I hate him. Let's kill him. I don't know. I kind of like him. He might be the Messiah. Like, everybody's still arguing. We've been in this series called Haters. If you're just joining us, the reason it's called that is because I, I was looking at the next few chapters of John, which we've been in for over a, nearly a year, and, <clears throat> and every single chapter, every single section is like, here's people who could look at Jesus in the face. They got to see him. They got to see or be at least close to miracles of what he was doing, the power of Jesus in front of them, and they all were just moaning and groaning about who is he, I don't like him, I don't like what he said, and they're missing the Savior of the world in front of them, and they hate him in many ways, and what we've been looking at is how does my heart come to actually hate and reject the love of God, because it's easy to look at people who are outright like I hate him. But in many ways, their arguments and their problems with him are are our problems with him. We just don't always say it that way. And that's no different with this text. So what's happening here is he's at a feast called Sukkot. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. And the whole point of this, it was a great celebration that went on for seven or eight days. And what, they, what Israel would do is they would come and every day there would be, this is one of the rituals they would do during this festival. They would grab a golden pail of water from Siloam, this uh, pool of Siloam where Jesus actually had done a healing before. And they would take the water up to the temple with wine. They would pour it out as, as evidence of the water flowing out into God's people. Uh, and and it, was a, it was a memory. So the reason it's called the, the Feast of Booths is it was a time for them to remember when God took them out of slavery, out of Egypt, into the desert where they had to have booths that they lived in, where they lived as nomads where they had to rely on God, where manna and bread from heaven had to fall for them just to get by. But more than that, so what happens at the last day of the festival is they light these 
big, huge torches that light up the whole city to remind people of how God led them through the desert, through the pillar, uh, pillar of fire. And then they would pour out this water, and it reminded them of the time that they were in a desert, thirsty, near death, and Moses struck a rock in which the water poured out from that rock. Every time, this whole festival is to remember. Remember we were thirsty, dying, getting out of slavery, but now ending up in a desert, and God provided. And not only would they sit there and remember and worship and dance and celebrate what God had done, they also then prayed for rain. They prayed that God would provide again, you know, and you got to think about it. They didn't have sophisticated systems like we have. They were dependent on God to bring rain for their survival, so they would do that at this festival. And this is the moment that Jesus, you know, he, at the beginning, he's like, I don't want to make a spectacle. And he chooses, though, he chooses very specifically this moment, the greatest point of celebration, when everything's about the living water being poured out from God to make a declaration that says he cries out. And he says what we read today, I am the living water. All who are thirsty, come to me and drink. I am the water that you're remembering. Like, come to me and drink, those who are thirsty. Everything you're looking for, for provision, for life, the, this fear that you have that you're not going to make it, I'm that for you. The thing I think about this is when they remember the desert, these are the places that you would never expect to look for water or the rock. You would never look to a rock and go, here is where I need to quench and get life and fill my soul. They never looked at the right places. And the same thing is going on with Jesus. He's standing in front of them. And they're looking for a Messiah, they're looking for salvation, they're looking for rain, they're looking for the gods to protect them, and Jesus is standing right in front of them, and they can't see that in unexpected places, God continues to provide, even though they're celebrating the many times God took something you would never expect, something that should never happen, and said, this is the way I work to bring you life. They're looking at Jesus and can't see it, and why? Today's sermon is titled, Finding Life between a rock and a hard place. And the reason is, is so this saying actually comes from about 100 years ago when people were working in mines. And they had a choice to go work in a mine where it was dangerous and deathly and get, get the black lung, you know. <laughs> um, and, but they, if they didn't work in the mines, they'd have to go out to their towns where their economy was struggling, where they barely had food. So they were caught between a rock and a hard place. Between do we go into these dangerous places of rock and quarry, or do I go and take our chances where we may not make it if we don't work, if we don't mind this thing. And I imagine that's how Israel felt, that's how people felt around Jesus, is our, our, our food is running out, we're in the middle of a desert, there's a hard place, between a rock and a hard place, we could go back to slavery. But what, what is better? Shall we go back to slavery where we have food? Should we stay in the desert with God but not know how we're going to have what we need? And that's the tension, the concern, and I think all of us can get there. Like, I have choices to make. And if I do this, this one is hard. If I do this, this one is hard. But the problem is we often don't look for life where God has offered it in the ways that we don't expect. We don't see it right in front of us. We're so consumed with the problems, and what we really miss is that the hard place isn't my circumstances. The hard place is actually what's going on inside my heart. The way I can live with hope in even the hardest of circumstances has to do with the condition of my heart. The way I can make heaven a hell and be in the, a utopian area, a, a land flowing with milk and honey, and hate it, just like Israelites did, is because my heart has become that hard place. Yet it was even in these places that they are sitting there at this festival remembering. Remember when God brought water from a rock, streams of living water? And while they're saying it with their lips... 
They forget that even in Israel, though they saw water flow from rocks that were struck, they still rejected God. They still said, you haven't done enough. Oh, you took us out of slavery by a ton of miracles. Oh, you led us through pillars of fire. Oh, you provided bread from heaven and water from a rock, but they still rejected God. And we'll read that today. I invite you today to think about this. Not simply have you rejected God, because most of you, if you're here, maybe you're here because somebody made you and you've rejected God. But overall, you're here because you're looking or you know him. But the, the question isn't simply, do I reject the love of God? It's, am I disconnected from it? Am I hardened to it? Even as one who says he believes. Here are God's people going, we believe God will provide. But when, when Jesus says, I'm the way he provides, they cannot receive it because their hearts are hardened. They actually said this in, in the desert in Israel. They complained about the not having water after all these miracles, and this is the word they said, is the Lord among us or not? I've seen miracles to get us out of slavery, the taking down of the Egyptians. I've seen waters. I, I've seen the Red Sea split, manna from heaven, but now I'm thirsty. Is the Lord among us or not? If that doesn't hit home, how many times you've seen God do something in the past and now something's not going right, the land is drying, dry, drying up, you're thirsty, you're struggling, you need something, and you're like, where's God? And they're doing this. Is this they're doing this to Jesus in our passage. Is he the Messiah? Is he just a great prophet? I don't know. Is he a deceiver? It's like, where is the Lord among us? I don't know. And Jesus has already just fed 5,000 people with bread. He's done the same things God has done. And again, they're like, is the Lord really here, though? Their hearts are hardened. Today, I want to look at how we become hardened like a rock to Jesus. If we look at one, I'm going to break this down section by section just in this little passage we read today. So in the first verse, I want us to look at, it says this, let anyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink. So that's part of our passage. Jesus stands up and goes, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. What is one of the reasons we become hardened to the things of God? Number one, we are not thirsty. We are not thirsty. We're full. Here's the reality. The richer you get, it says it in the Bible, the fuller you get, the more comfortable you get, the more safe you get, the less you go, I have a need for God. I've shared this, but I'll share it again. In countries with the highest GDP, and the, America has been one of the only outliers, and that's changing, but with the, high, the countries with the highest economic growth are the most atheistic in the world. And that's true at our individual level. The greater I can provide for myself, the less I know that I'm thirsty for the things of God. So that is number one. There's a point in Deuteronomy, and this is one of my favorite passages because it really encapsulates this idea. And he says this, when you eat, he's, he's telling Israel, like, I'm about to bless you. I'm going to give you the promised land. When you eat and are satisf satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, when your hands and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, you go, wow, thank you, God. He goes, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God. Then you see, it's not rejection, it's disconnection. You can, these people still are living in their houses, doing well, and, just go, and not going, I hate God. They're just going, I don't got time for that because they don't need it. You have time for whatever you need, right? You have time for whatever you need. So if you say, I don't have time for this spiritual stuff, church stuff, worship stuff, you've gotten too full. He said, you will become proud. You'll forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land back when you were struggling. With his venomous snakes and scorpions, 
and he brought you water out of a hard rock. Do you remember that God made the possible, the impossible possible? Do you remember that he was there for you when your life wasn't going as planned? And now that you've grown rich, you're so full, you're not even thirsty. So you go, I'll drink someday. I'll go get him later. The next part of this verse says this. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said. I'm going to break this down bit by bit. So first he says, if you are thirsty, you're going to come to me. He says, whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said. See, one of the reasons we become hardened to the things of God is we are thirsty, but we're looking for life in all the wrong places. We don't really believe Christ. We don't believe that he's enough. We don't believe that he will fulfill me and increase my contentment with my life, that he will make me feel more worth than everything I chase. So it's like, yeah, I'm thirsty, but I don't know that I believe in him to actually do that. Maybe you believe in him that when you die, you go to heaven. But I don't know if I believe in him to be present in the things I struggle with now. So you know you're thirsty. I have needs. I have desires. I'm struggling. I have wants. I want to fix things in my life. But I don't know that Jesus is that, truly. But I have an idea that other things are that. When we look at Israel in the desert, it said this. In the story where the water comes from a rock, it's in Exodus 17, if you want to read that story. It says, but the people were thirsty for water there. And they grumbled against Moses. Mind you, this is Moses who took them through a dead sea by splitting it, you know. Like, pretty good dude to them. And they're like, I hate you. You got us out of slavery, you jerk. And they grumble against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? See, they're thirsty and they know it. They're thirsty and they know it. But they're going, you know where it was better? And this happens throughout the Bible. They go, you know where it was better? Egypt. They forget the lashes on the back, the grueling. I mean, if you ever look at those pyramids, how insane that people built this with their backs. Right? And they did this. They were a part of this. And they're like, you know where we would not be thirsty anymore? Where we'd find happiness, fulfillment, and life flowing through us? Egypt. If we went back to slavery. See, they knew they needed something, but they couldn't depend on God. They're like, I don't know if I need him to provide in a desert. I just need my, my captors. And see, we still do that. We go, I know I'm thirsty. Lord, I know I need love. I just don't think Jesus loving me is enough. So I'm going to go look for it in the places that bring me to slavery over and over again. I'm going to get on my second and third marriage. This time it'll work. We just keep going and look for it. Maybe this time. Because I believe Jesus loves me theoretically. But I'm looking for life in all the wrong places. I know Jesus loves me, but I'm going to work my butt off. Because I know that what I'm thirsty for is security, safety, comfort, brand names, feeling rich, feeling, feeling good about myself. I don't think Jesus is enough to make me feel worthy. So I'm looking. I am thirsty. I have needs. But I'm going to go look for it in Egypt. In the places that have always let me down, always left me even worse off than when I first begun. See, that was the whole point of this whole festival, is to remember what God had done in the desert. He said, I don't want you to forget. Everything's gone well for you at times, and at times not. But I don't want you to forget what God has done, that in the most impossible places, in the places that were so hardened, so dead of life, I brought real life without slavery, without you being mistreated, without you 
dying. We do that with everything, body image, politics. I know God is in control, but I need these people to be in more control or else. Like, you know you're thirsty for change, but you don't believe God is enough. Right? You know you're thirsty to feel like you're beautiful, like you you have significance, like your body is beautiful, but you don't really believe that you were made in the image of God, that that is not what constitutes beauty. Right? I know I'm thirsty. I just think I'm going to find it elsewhere. And that elsewhere is actually the one enslaving you over and over and over again. The third part of this. Let anyone who is thirsty, and then the emphasis here is come to me and drink. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. So in this case, you know that you're thirsty. You know that there's need in your life, that you're like, man, my life is struggling and hurting. And I need water. I need God, maybe. I need Jesus. But he says, if you are thirsty and you know you need that, then come. Come and be in my presence. Take me in. Like, put me in here. Put me in here emotionally. Put me in here mentally. Come and take me in. That's the presence of God. And so, so many of us go, oh, yeah, gosh, I always need God. But it's like, hey, it's time to be in his presence. It's time to come worship at church. It's time to get in the word of God with others. And you're like, I, I don't do that. I don't get into the word very often because, you know, words and books, that's 66 books. I haven't read that much in my whole life. But that, he's like, this, this is the word of life, he says in the Bible. This is the word of life. So you go, yeah, I know I need things. I know I should be actually looking to God and not all these other things. But for some reason, I just don't feel him. And I can almost, with some exceptions, guarantee that if you say you're desiring God but don't feel any sense of his presence in your mind or heart, you probably aren't around. It's not not really science. If you're like, Nick, I want to be best friends with you. And I'm like, cool, I don't have any, but let's do that. And I'm like, when do you want to hang out? Oh, I just can't. Okay, maybe next week? Yeah, 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 next week. I'm like, hey, you want to do this 10-week class with me to get to know me? No, 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 not 10 weeks. I want to know you in one week. Is that possible? No, you can't know me in one week. I'm a complicated man. Do you want to go do something fun with me? No, I do not. I don't find that fun. We're going to go to a concert and sing. I don't enjoy that. Okay. Do you want to read my autobiography that tells you all about me? I'm not a reader. So let me get this straight. You don't want to be with me. You don't want to go places with me. You don't want to work with me. You don't want to read about me. But I do want to be best friends with you. Does it sound stupid to anybody else? Yeah. All right, there's your, there's your faith. <laughs> All right? It's not a mystery. Come to me and drink. If, you be, if you're like, gosh, I, just, I need to have this in my life, you've got to come and take it in consistently. If you were like, man, I'm really thirsty. I feel like I'm going to die. i got a headache. I got, I, I'm dizzy. And then you're like, and I'm like, do you want some water? No, I don't want water. Maybe next week? Can I just have some vodka? No. That doesn't quite fulfill the needs of your body. Right? Like everything but coming to the source of life to drink. And then you go, well, why am I so thirsty? Still. All right. 
That was longer than I had in my notes. <laughs> the last portion of this verse I want us to look at, and this is a big one, so I want you to, if you're bored, straighten up. This is, this get, this is the, where the rubber hits the road, okay? Here's what it says. If you are thirsty, come to me and drink. Next verse. Because rivers of living water will flow from within you. And by this, and this is rare. Sometimes the, the Bible will actually give you something that you have to decode and figure out a little bit. This one, he's telling you. Here's what he means. Rivers of living water will flow from within you. By this, he meant the Holy Spirit. Whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that point, they hadn't had the Spirit because Jesus had not died and resurrected and been glorified. I'll get to that in just a little bit. But he says, rivers of living water will flow from within you if you are thirsty and you come and drink of him. What does that mean? Well, one of the reasons our hearts become so hard is because even as believers, even as people who go to church, even as people maybe you participate in churchy-like things, and I'll just be the first to admit, this has been me most of my Christian life, even as a ministry leader until recently. We do not allow the Holy Spirit to wash over us. I know that's fluffy language. I'll try to break that down. We don't allow the Holy Spirit to wash over us. What does that even mean? And who is the Holy Spirit? Just recently, our staff, we, we went away on a retreat, and I actually didn't plan for this, so that tells me it was God. We ended up getting on these conversations, and then other conversations came in and had the same conversation about the Holy Spirit, and we all realized, you know what? This is a significant, significant aspect of the Scriptures in our faith, and we probably couldn't all articulate it the same way. So we need to study it. So we spent the last two months studying the Holy Spirit and going, does this really play an active role in my life, this belief, this person that we believe in, that the Bible talks about, and who is he, and do we, can I even understand it? Do I understand it? Really? Like more than just a repeating something on a page. And yet Jesus is saying, like, if you come to me, this person is going to wash through you and within you. Like, it's going to fill you that when I die, do you know that Jesus, we're going to get into this later in the book of John, but Jesus actually says this statement. He says, it is necessary. I know you're sad that I'm going to die and leave, and you're like, you can't. He goes, it's actually necessary. I need to die. I need to resurrect. I need to go back to heaven, because if I don't, you will not receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it is greater that he is in you than I am in this world. Holy moly. It's not that he is greater than Jesus. It's that what Jesus is saying is the very spirit that animates his whole life, the nature of God in him. He is God. He's like, I, it's going to be in you when I die and resurrect. The very thing. The very person. Is the Holy Spirit. He goes, that is, it is more important that that happens for you than me staying here. That's hard to even wrap my head around. So, it's a big deal. I'm going to try to sum it up in 10 minutes. You can be in church, and I'm one of them, so I'm saying this from experience. You can be in church, you can be a pastor, you can be in ministry, you can serve, you can do really great works. And not engage with the Holy Spirit and have him washing over your soul. Okay? I've done it most of my professional life. All right? So I'm going to challenge you to think through this. And here's some clues whether the Holy Spirit is active in your life. How do we know if the Holy Spirit is bringing life to our hardened hearts? That's the question. He says it is water. It is living, moving, flowing water that if you come to Christ and you drink, the Holy Spirit runs through you. How do we know if the Spirit, okay, actually, I got to go back. Hold on. Don't, you can write it down, but 
I have this funny story that I have to share. My brother, I wish he was here. We had this funny experience years ago. Um, my sister had something at her church, and she wanted us to go to it. I don't know what it was. So we go to her church, and I want, you, I want to preface this. We are a Baptocostal church. Like, you fit in here regardless of what you believe on that front. Um, but I went to a more Pentecostal church at my sister's church, and we are in there, and I swear to you, I, you think I'm being funny? This is really how it went, because my brother and I are looking at each other the whole time, and he's like, all right, do you feel the spirit? I want you to put your right foot in. And he's like, and your left foot in. And I'm like, and your right foot out, hand out. And I'm like, what are we doing? The spiritual hokey pokey. <laughs> and then he says this. He goes, do you feel the spirit? He goes, I want you to place your hands on your abdomen. And do you feel the spirit flow through you? And I look at my brother. He looks at me. I'm like, I think I'm going to pee myself. Like, <laughs> what is happening? He's trying to make us pee our pants. And I say that. It's a funny story. It really happened. I'm just like, I'm confused. And this might be why I didn't understand the Holy Spirit for so long. Because, it, and I want to say this. I want to say this with all seriousness. It is n too often when you hear about the Holy Spirit, you connect it to these, these feelings of like I felt and I was overcome and people were crying in laughter or some type of miraculous thing. And I'm actually not against any of that. But what I'm going to tell you today is one of the major things, some of the major things that the Bible says the Holy Spirit does has nothing to do with that. And so, so often it's about how did I feel? Did I feel him with my abdomen pushed, flowing through me? And I'm going to share some scripture with you because there are things the Holy Spirit does, and it's not that he doesn't do those things. doesn't move through you. That you don't feel. I, I know he does, actually. But that, that's not his primary nature of what he does. And I'm going to talk to you and share with you some scriptures on this. So number one, Jesus says it's like wa living water flowing through you. First of all, what does water do? Water renews. It brings life. If you are dying on the ground, dehydrated, and you're on the verge of death, the first thing we're going to do is let's get some water in them. When you go to the hospital, what do they do? Put it in your arm. I need it flowing through me. You need constant water because that brings life. And so you might have been dead in the ground, and all of a sudden you're revitalized because somebody got you water. It's now flowing through you, and you're brought back to life. Even your skin clears up when you drink water. Did you know that? I've been on a gallon, just like I'm hitting 40, a gallon a day. It brings things back to life. If you feel dead as a Christian and just blasé and, you know, I'm not, I'm not really into it. I go, but I don't really, like, is there life blooming from within you? I'm going to say something. I'm going to say it really clearly. I did not choose Christ. For some reason, one day in my 20s, he flipped a switch in me in which I went from going, he's interesting, to like, I need to do this with my whole life. And it's not because I'm a good person. I am absolutely not. I was shallow. I was narcissistic. I didn't give a rip about the poor. And one day, everything clarified because the Holy Spirit, for whatever reason, chose to bring life to my dry, dead soul. And that's what he does. He brings life. You see, you're vibrant, and you're like, oh my gosh, I want this thing. I, before, I was just like, uh, dead about it as a zombie. Now I, I want, I desire, I, I thirst for this thing. Before I was forced, now I'm like, gosh, I can't live without this. Not always, just to be clear. But when the Holy Spirit is active, he brings life. Number two, water cleanses. And this is a big one. Water cleanses. I'm going to read you something from Jesus himself, which we'll cover next year in John. <laughs> it's so funny because I was like, oh, I shouldn't teach this part because, you know, it's in John and it's coming later. 
And I'm doing the math. I'm like, like in April next year. So I'm like, you're not going to remember anything I said. I can do this twice. So, but Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit in a very important chapter where he really goes in on this and describes it. And it's in John 16. And he says, I'm going to send him to you. And he will prove to the world to be, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin, about what is right and what is wrong, righteousness, about what makes man right, and about judgment. Here's how I can tell you when I know that the Holy Spirit is beginning to work, that it's flowing through you or me, is I begin to hate the things that I used to be okay with. I begin to have a distaste for the things that I used to be like, it's not a big deal. I begin to see stuff in my soul that in the past I just chalked up to my personality. I begin to see things that I used to make excuses for. You know, I'm that way just because I'm just that way. And now I see them and I go, I don't want this. It reveals, the Holy Spirit reveals things within me that before I had no eyes to see about what is righteous, what is good, what is holy, and I don't have a taste as much as I used to for it because the Holy Spirit is flowing through me. Now, let me be clear. I, it doesn't, I don't want to paint a picture of like you get it and it changes and then you're done. I ebb and flow in my walk with God. I fail, and I, and I fail deeply sometimes with sin and selfishness inside of my soul. Darkness. But let me tell you what the Holy Spirit does. As long as he is working, as long as I am near, he goes, Nick, what happened to you? How did you get this far? How did you get this dark? And in the past, I would have just made excuses. This is just the way I am. That's how my mom raised me. Naughty by nature. And now, when I'm in this dark place, there's a spotlight on my soul going, what happened, son? How did you get so far? How did you make that okay? It reveals things that in the past I just had an excuse for. And it makes me go, I don't want that. I want that, but I don't want that. Even when I was on vacation, I already shared this, but I'll share it. Like, I've never been one for money. I don't really care about it that much. It's never been a driver in my life. And then all of a sudden, I'm in Huntington Beach on my vacation, and I'm watching all these rich people in their Lululemon And I'm like, I want some Lululemon. (laughs) And I'm in this nice beach house. And I'm like, I want a beach house. And then I looked at Redeemers. I'm like, I'm not getting a beach house while I'm at Redeemers. (laughs) I've never been like that. But you know what the Holy Spirit does? It looks and... It casts judgment as it should. He casts judgment as he should and goes, how did you get here? You've never been comfortable, like like caring about comfort and luxury like this. He reveals, and I go, yeah, Lululemon's uncomfortable. I don't want that. They're being duped. $100 for leggings that you shouldn't even be wearing out there anyway. Especially me. <laughs> but all seriousness, it, was, uh, it doesn't matter that I'm not perfectly walking, that the spotlight's always there going, hey, and not out of shame, not out of guilt, just like, no, like, why do I want these things? And as soon as I get in contact and presence and drink more of the Holy Spirit, I'm like, I don't want that. I got distant and hardened. I got comfortable. I didn't reject God. I just got disconnected. 
I got disconnected from the Spirit, from, word, from the Word, from prayer a little bit, a little removed over time, and all of a sudden I'm like, you know what I need to feel good about myself? Something I've never needed before. It cleanses, it reveals things. The Holy Spirit at work, he cleanses and reveals. And that should be changing in your life if you have a presence of the Spirit at work in you. You should be coming to a place where you're going, you know, I used to listen to this garbage. And I actually don't like it anymore. I used to say when I was a teenager, I don't even hear the words. Liars. I know, I'm talking to my teens. I said, every one of us has used that. And I can quote every one of them now on stage. So I heard the words, but now I hear them and I go, gosh, I, this isn't fun. I don't enjoy it. It should be changing something. I used to write sermons to Tupac when I first got here. <laughs> Swear to you. And now I'm like, that is ridiculous. Like, it's outrageous. But the Spirit has had to slowly work on me. But it should. It should be changing my tastes. It should be changing my perspectives on my body and on sexuality and on all these desires. It should be changing things that I used to say, oh, I need that. It's fine. It's not a big deal to going, I don't, I don't know that I want that anymore. And when I do, something has happened in the disconnect between me and the Spirit. That's all I'll say. It's true for me. I hope you can see that in your life. Like when I know, and I do, and I fall into these traps of going, I do, I, I need this stuff to feel better. I know I have a disconnect between me and the Spirit of God, and almost always it's true. I've been disconnected in my journaling and prayer. I've been disconnected in my worship. Almost always it's true. Lastly, and so importantly, water flows from a source outward. Water flows. And here's why I'm bringing this up. It's because we can get so into these conversations about who the Holy Spirit is. Some of you, maybe you come from churches where that's all they talked about. But what they talked about is what he can do for you. How he can make you feel, what miracles he can provide. If you really had faith, you could get healed. And it's not to say that the Holy Spirit cannot do that for you. It's to say, I want to read some scriptures of what Jesus says one of his main, main jobs is and roles in your life. John 7, Jesus says this, Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. One of the things you'll see throughout the Bible is that one of the chief roles of the Holy Spirit at work in my life is that he glorifies Jesus in my eyes, and it makes me want to glorify Jesus in others. That it lifts up, it spotlights Christ. That movement of the Spirit lifts up Jesus as primary in my life. Glorifies means I go, I want to worship you, I want to know you, I want, I want to be near you. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It spotlights Jesus. He spotlights Jesus. And then in 16 he says, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will glorify me. He will glorify Jesus because it is from Jesus that he will receive what I will make known to you. What he will make known to you. What he's saying is all that Jesus knows about himself, about the nature of salvation, about the Messiah, about the world, like he's going to bestow that truth within you through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, you could read the same passage and one day the God is moving within your spirit and you're like, I've never read this and I'm seeing the world differently because I've read it over and over again and I never understood it, but now I see things. I see things about the truth of God. That's one of the most important roles of the Holy Spirit is to reveal who Christ is in deeper and deeper depths within my soul where I really believe it, not just theoretically. And then lastly in 15, John 15, he says, The Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father will testify about me, and you also must testify. That's what it's saying. It's going to preach to your soul the importance of Jesus, not just to your head. See, so many of us, most of us, we've spent our time in church going, I believe, I have lifted my hands, I, I think I agree, maybe I agree halfway, but it's all been here. And you know there's a massive difference between I know a person and oh, I know a person. 
Like, I love that person. There's a big difference between being like, oh, I love that person. And like, I would die for that person. That's here. And he's saying, it will testify about my love to you. It will testify about, the Spirit will testify about how much I love you. And it will be meaningful, not just, oh, Jesus loves me. It will reveal God's truth about the nature of Christ and who he is to your life. And what you're to do in the world. Who am I to love today? There will be an understanding of what God desires deep down that you didn't have before. How do you know if the Holy Spirit is running through you? You're seeing things you hate that you used to be fine with that were even okay to everyone else, but it's just not okay to my soul anymore. You're bringing life. You're like, I have a passion. I desire. I've been in church 40 years, but now I want him. I want him. But most importantly, you're going, I need to know Jesus. I want to come to the source. And the Holy Spirit draws you to him. And that's what I was saying. When I came to faith, it wasn't because I'm a good guy. I don't know what it was, and I never knew what it was until now. It was God, for some reason, saying, I'm going to change your soul and your spirit and renew you. And I'm going to make you want things you never cared about. And I'm going to make you believe things you never believed. And you know what's so beautiful about that is I can take zero credit. There's nothing good in me. There was nothing good in me then. Still, it's pretty questionable. But I know that something transformed all of a sudden. And what that did is it made me go, I really want to know him. I used to ask questions about him. Now I want to know And I will not rest until that thirst is quenched to know the source. The source of who this person is. Friends, if you have a lackadaisical desire to know Christ, something's gone wrong. If if at no point, I'm not saying you can't have bad down days, but at no point you find this like, God, I need to know you. I want to go after you. If if that's not there, you have a disconnect to the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm saying the life that God offers is not flowing through. And he's saying if you're thirsty, you have to come and drink. And then if you come and drink, if you're present and you're open and you open your hearts to God, I don't know how you work, but move your Holy Spirit in me. That he does. There are two ways for our hardened hearts to find new life. As I close here. If you're sitting here and you know my heart's on life support. It's cold. I have no affection for this thing. For this thing called church. If you're feeling that way, there's two ways that your heart can be opened up. Number one, you can be struck and broken. If you're comfortable and you don't need him, if you're fat and you don't need him, fat on wealth, if you're chasing money and you don't need him and you're not hungry and you're not thirsty and you know it, there's one way out of it to be ruined, to lose everything, to destroy your relationships, to get yourself in rehab, to lose your business until you're thirsty again, to be struck, to be broken, to be humbled. That's number one. But there is a greater way. You can wait for yourself to be struck and broken, or you can look to the one who says that he is the rock that was struck to bring you life. This is so phenomenal. This is written in the New Testament by Paul. He says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, That our ancestors were all under that cloud, that miraculous cloud. They all passed through the Red Sea. They all ate the same spiritual bread from heaven. And they drank from the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. This is a mysterious thing. But he says, nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness because their hearts were hardened. They were stuck between a rock and a hard place. And instead of looking to the rock that was struck to bring them life, they looked to everything else but that. And their hearts were hardened until they died. 
He's like, you can be in the wilderness dying and be struck until you go, God, we need you, which is what they did over and over again. Or you can go, there was a rock that was struck for me, and out of that destruction of that rock came the flowing waters of life. And Jesus says, and the Bible says that was Jesus. He was struck. He was pierced for you. And if you would just stop and go, I need to look at the one who has been struck for me and fall in love with the one who has been struck for me and come and drink of him, then it will change what is going on in my soul. Then it will change my heart and heart. The rock in the hard place is not your bad circumstances. It is the disconnect and hardening of my heart to God. And the rock is Christ who has been struck for you who has died for you, who was put on a cross for you. He says, come to me, know me. Don't know me like an autobiography that you read. Don't know me like you see me every once, every six, year, every six months. Know me, come and drink of me like you need water. And then open your soul to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you start praying. I don't even know how this works, but Holy Spirit, change me because I cannot do this on my own. Do you want the Holy Spirit flowing through you? And that's the prayer. That's the prayer I've started this year for everyone here, including me. Every Sunday I look out to you and I go, God, my words will never suffice. Words and actions and programs do not change our love of God. The Holy Spirit does, and we have to open ourselves to him. Amen? Amen. We're going to worship about the Holy Spirit. Will you join me and worship from your soul? And if you don't want to sing, pray, God, speak to me. Change me. Transform me. Holy Spirit, move because I can't do this on my own. Amen? Amen? Let's sing together. Father, once again, we just pray, Lord, that you are honored by the way we lift our voice. Lord, for those who know if they've experienced a distance and a hardening of heart, Lord, I pray that you would draw them near. Lord, as you have drawn so many without any Word, we didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We didn't choose it, Lord, that you draw our hearts to love you. I pray for everyone here that you would draw their hearts to know the joy, the life, the cleansing, the power that comes from your spirit at work, that it is that it was so important for us to know you in that way that you said it was better for me to leave so that the Holy Spirit might be present. Lord, God, I pray that the Spirit moves in everyone here, Lord, to cleanse us, to renew us, to rebuild us, to restore us, regenerate us, and to make us more like you. In Jesus' mighty name, may God's grace and peace be with you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.